So um, I want to start by going back uh, several thousand years. Uh, images have always had incredible power. Um, they've changed markets. This is a, a photograph of John F. Kennedy at his inauguration. And in fact, what's notable about this image is not what's in it, but what's not in it. Uh, he's not wearing a hat. And actually, uh, this may or may not be urgen, urban legend. There's a fair amount of dispute about it. But the fact that he wasn't wearing a hat is generally attributed, uh, is generally attributed to the complete and utter fall of the hat market. Uh, in the early 60s when men stopped wearing hats. And so you can blame you know, US governments for a lot of things, including the demise of the hat market. Uh, <laughs> and images also make us laugh. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this photo uh, and the video too many times at this point to count. Uh, it's also kind of interesting to think about the fact that this is an you know, a month old or so, and it, pro and it seems like ancient history. So images also move very, very quickly in time. Um, and they can also tell our history. And this particular image has been circulating a lot recently in my country and, uh, and tells a very moving and very powerful story of, of some crises that we're experiencing. But I want to talk also a little bit about the numbers, just to give you a sense of what this market looks like. Uh, this chart comes from Mary Meeker. She's a noted venture capitalist in the US. And she does an annual report, which is sort of the you know, internet bible of, of data. And um, what she's looking at here is the growth in sharing behavior of consumers, of images, of photographs. And in fact, it's very difficult to figure out how many images are being shared daily. But if you look at this chart, you'll see that over 3 billion photographs alone are being shared every single day by consumers. And that's only including Facebook properties and Snapchat. And so you can imagine if you factor in Line, if you factor in Kik, if you factor in WhatsApp and other messaging platforms, it's much, much higher. So there's a ton going on with this. We all see it. We all feel it. Um, there are other ways in which images are becoming more predominant. This, was, this is um, some data based on a study that was done last year in Wales. According to this study, the fastest growing language in the United Kingdom is this, in terms of the growth. And when you think about it, it makes sense because actually emoji are a very economical way of expressing emotion. And in this study as well, there was also um, a comment made by the researchers that they found that teenagers actually prefer to use emoji to convey deep feelings. They're more comfortable using emoji than they are using language. And I think, you know, intuitively that makes sense. So I want to kind of pivot a little bit now and talk about business and why this would be relevant for, um, for the business world. And in the conversations that I had, there were several comments made from people that they generally see a lot of images that include their brand, but at scale, it's really impossible to understand. And the reason is that people are talking about a brand, but they're not talking to the brand, or the brand is evident in a photograph but it's not actually being mentioned by name. And I want to explain how that works. So this is Anna Ivanovich at the US Open. In the background, you can see an Olympus logo. You can also see Sony Ericsson. There's something else there, and it says US Open. And so what the technology companies are saying roughly, and again, this is anecdotal, but this is within a very fine band in the companies who are working on computer vision. They're saying about 80% of the content that they see about brands do not explicitly mention a brand. And it makes sense when you think about it, because if you were to take this, if you were to be lucky enough to go to Wimbledon or the US Open and take this photograph and upload it, you wouldn't say, oh, look, here's Anna Ivanovich at the US Open standing in front of an Olympus logo. You know, it's not, <laughs> not really the way that people communicate. Um, so I want to give some examples. Sorry, I want to give some examples of business value. Um, here are the w some of the ways uh, that businesses are now using this technology, and uh, I actually found 30 separate use cases just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, the first is brand health. So when you think about, for example, a shipping company who is sending packages and the packages are damaged, or you think about a company that's been involved in a crisis of some sort, very often people will photograph a product or a scene 
um, and they'll hashtag it fail or they'll hashtag it something rude. And they won't say who the brand is, but the brand is evident in the photo. Um, you also see in examples of, for example, the, the US Open one in this other tennis photo, you see, of course, a lot of business to business companies will actually make huge investments in sponsorships. This is another way for them to count the impressions that they see uh, from that sponsorship investment and actually figure out an ROI based upon that. Uh, so visual content, obviously very important, but this also gives us another way to measure. The next is in terms of revenue generation. One of the things I thought was really interesting uh, came from a company called Sanitarium in Australia. They make breakfast cereal, wheat bix Many of you may have eaten it in the past. It's basically shredded wheat. Um, one bowl of shredded wheat, impossible to tell from another bowl of shredded wheat, but the logos are detectable. And what they want to know is, when people eat our breakfast cereal, what else is on their breakfast table? And so you can imagine that these moments of consumption are really interesting. The next is things like operational efficiency. That could be anything from fraud and risk detection, so oil of oule, uh, all the way to other types of fraud uh, or counterfeit or trademark infringement, that sort of thing. Next, we have customer experience, the damage package, uh, the long call center wait time, anything that can be expressed in a photograph. And then finally, uh, innovation. So when people are using products in interesting and innovative ways, or thinking about new flavors, thinking about other kinds of ways of using products that were not necessarily part of the original plan, what can we learn about that? So that's the dry stuff. Um, I want to tell you uh, that all of the companies that I spoke with for this research, they're all actually trying to figure out some sort of monetary value of the work that they're doing with images, very much like what we saw in the early days of natural language processing. Um, so really where this can go with the proper uh, support organizationally is the ability to take this data, because this is unstructured data, turn it into something that's a meaningful signal and use it to predict, uh, or at least to start to understand what the drivers are of the future. So in order to explain this, let me talk a little bit about what computers actually can see, and then we're going to get to some fun examples. So in this photograph, you have a child, you have binoculars, you have a, uh, we call it an anorak, the green guy. Um, the child is smiling, it's outside. What we can see, or what computers can see in images are objects, so binocular, the child, or human, trees, if they were in better resolution, probably. Um, scenes, outdoors, a concert, a conference, a, con uh, a protest, um, any kind of uh, a sporting game, any kind of that sort of thing. The next would be attributes, so the number of people, the colors in the photo, the um, volume of things, the, uh, you know, all that sort of thing in terms of the attributes. Uh, also, other attributes that can find are content that isn't safe for work, meaning pornography or violent content. Um, and then the fourth one would be emotion, in this case, happiness. And so what makes this possible is artificial intelligence. And what makes artificial intelligence possible are these things called neural networks, which are basically computer simulations of how the brain works. And in order to do this, you think about the way that a toddler, for example, would learn. And when a toddler is little, they point to pretty much any animal, a cow, a chicken, and they say, doggy. And then you teach them over time that, in fact, there are different kinds of animals. And then they learn from that there are different kinds of dogs and different kinds of cows. And this is how we learn. Computers are very similar, too. Uh, in this case, in the top, in the top uh, part of the picture, you see backpacks. And one of the things that we know innately from backpacks is that a backpack can be any color or print, and it's still a backpack. You sort of have to train a computer to understand that. The same with beagles. Beagles have a particular conformation of their head, particular colors, etc. Uh, and there are these qualities that innately mean beagle that we understand and that computers also need to learn using a lot of data. And that, in many cases, that means thousands and thousands of images. But you can still fool it. This is a meme that was circling in the US. I'm not sure if it got here. 
This is puppy or bagel. Uh, there was also a really good one that was sloth or blueberry muffin. I could have done this all afternoon, but uh, I figured you, you guys want to have lunch. But um, puppy or bagel is a little tough. So since we're um, a TOA, and since we're talking a little bit about art here today, I wanted to use some art to, uh, to give you a little bit of an experiment to see how this works. So we have two paintings. On the left, we have uh, Olympia by Manet. On the right, we have the Venus of Urbino. When Olympia was first presented in 1865, it caused this incredible stir. There are some elements of the painting that were extremely controversial, not least of which were the flowers being presented to the woman, the expression on her face, um, there, there are a number of little details in there, the cat, all of which signal that the flowers most likely came from a customer, not a suitor, which was very uh, provocative for the time. And they actually had to station guards in the room where the painting was to prevent people from defacing it. Now, the Venus of Urbino, which is compositionally very similar, had actually been hanging in the Uffizi Gallery at that point for centuries. So what happens if you take these paintings and you put them through uh, a computer vision program? Let me show you. So you're not going to be able to read these words, but you see a lot of tags here in the middle, and the tags have to do with elements of the painting. The things that I circled on the top were religion in the Manet. Um, and if you look to the right, you see those are all religious paintings. And what that tells you is that the data that this painting is being compared to is comprised mostly of religious paintings. And so this reminds me of the old uh, you know, the old saying, if all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. In computer vision, if all you have is a religious painting, everything is a religious painting. So the difficulty here is that you need to be able to show the computer lots of different types of paintings for it to start to understand the difference. In the bottom with Venus, for, somehow it picked out, for some reason it picked out love, and so there are lots of pictures of people sitting in bed together, reading, and so on and so forth. Now I'm going to give you a second experiment. Sorry, I should have given you a nudity warning, but I forgot. Um, so this is another image, not art, uh, although I suppose arguably you could say it is. And this image, of course, was particularly famous when it came out for lots of reasons that um, I will not take responsibility for. But I thought it would be really interesting to put this image of Kim Kardashian through the same filter and see what happened. So this is what happened. <laughs> In the middle, the tags are things like glamour, fashion, exotic, love, erotic, romance, you know, those sorts of things. And it's very, it's fairly accurate. Um, on the right, there's, an, there's sort of a dramatic lack of something relevant, and that something relevant would actually be another living human woman. Um, what this tells you, oh, and the images are, are really fantastic. There are a couple of lamps, there's a hookah pipe, there's a, a wine bottle opener, there is a harp, and my favorite, the literal hourglass. And so what the computer is looking for is actually the edges of the image to try to reconcile what it is. What this tells you about the data that was used to train, uh, or, or the data that this was compared to, is that it hadn't been trained properly. But in everyday language, what that really means is that the algorithm had literally never seen a human woman before. And so this is what happens when we kind of skip the step of properly training the data. And that has a lot of implications for organizations. So um, the caveats for this are that the technology, while it's very sophisticated in some places, so for example, Google's um, violence and pornography filters are, are as about as sophisticated as you can get. They're state of the art for today. Um, the technology is still very new. It's very good at recognizing objects. It's less good at recognizing context. But it can be used, and it is being used in organizations around the world. The next thing is this idea of training data means that there is no sort of input in, output out, and then you have an answer. It's a, it requires a culture of whether you want to call it agile development, whether you want to call it continuous improvement. But the, the cultural impact that it has is that 
people can't expect the answer to be correct the first time out. And so it requires that sort of rigor and discipline and also the willingness to fail over and over and over again. The next thing is that the methodologies are very challenging. And so all of these things are evolving both in the business, in the in sort of world of industry, and also in the world of academia, where researchers are using images to try to better understand the world. So I have a friend who teaches at um, University of Illinois, who's a research scientist there, and they're actually doing research into how people talk about quitting smoking. And as part of that research, they're also looking at the way that people share images of marijuana smoking. And they're neutral about marijuana. And the reason that they're doing this is that they're, they're involved with this, uh, the United States Center for Disease Control to try to understand patterns of smoking behavior. The pot smoking doesn't bother them. But what they found is that when people take photographs of themselves smoking marijuana, very frequently they're mixing it with tobacco. And so the challenge for them is that they want to better understand um, how, much, how many people are actually starting to smoke tobacco because they're smoking marijuana. So, that's, so the methodologies that they use are very difficult to replicate because you have to go out and actually get the same data, which, given that the internet is a, a fast-moving phenomenon, is hard to do, and also the data costs money. You can't just, you know, it isn't just there for the taking. The next thing is that, you know, as I mentioned, it isn't instantaneous. Um, you can't say, give me a report, you know, by Friday uh, that includes X, Y, and Z. It takes some time. Um, and so that's really changing the way that people kind of approach analysis. Um, one of the upsides of that, actually, that's kind of interesting, is that if this is an organization that is interested in using artificial intelligence in any meaningful way in the future, this isn't a bad way to start. And so it's kind of a good on-ramp to AI. And then finally, the privacy context can be very creepy. So for example, if I tweet something about, let's say, an airline experience that I had, you know, and I hashtag United or Lufthansa or something, that's one thing. And then the airline you know, pretty much understands that I'm willing to be contacted uh, because of that tweet. But if I photograph the Lufthansa or let's say United uh, customer service area and the line sneaking down the hallway and they, un and they see that Lufthansa or United logo and then contact me, that's kind of creepy. Uh, there's also facial recognition. Um, sports franchises really want to understand emotion detection. Are people smiling? Do they look excited? Um, if you think about that on an aggregate level in your sports franchise, maybe you want to understand excitement over time. But if you can actually uh, detect an individual's emotional state in a photograph, again, creepy. So I want to give you a little bit of the bad news and end with a little bit of the good news about this kind of technology. So here's the bad news. The bad news is that artificial intelligence replicates human bias. So if we have biased data, we have biased answers. Um, not only does it replicate it, it makes it so much more efficient. So it actually increases your possibility of making horrible decisions much more efficiently. Um, so this image is actually something called the Shirley card, and it's from the 50s, 1950s. And this photo right here on the lower your lower right, is of the original Shirley, and she worked at Kodak in the 50s. And at the time, they were rolling out these photo labs that you, know, you would take in the olden days. You would take your photographs to be developed at the photo lab. And they needed to send something to help the photo lab technicians color correct the photos. So they said, OK, well, let's take a picture of a typical woman and we'll send it out to all the photo labs. And if Shirley looks good, then the photo will look good. And this other woman in the middle is the version of Shirley from the 70s, I think. And in fact, they had many, many different versions of Shirley. They, they were all obviously had different names, but they call, still call them the Shirley card. So the problem with this Shirley card was that 
women with this particular skin tone looked fantastic. Women with darker skin tones did not look so fantastic, nor did men. And so part of the challenge was when you set a norm that expects a certain skin tone, or in the case of, for example, something that we have in the US that you may have here, probably less likely, called predictive policing. Uh, when you're using algorithms to determine the probability that somebody will commit a crime, if you have a lot of data that's demographic data, you could very easily be targeting people um, in a way that furthers discrimination and bias. And so the important thing about computer vision technology, as any other technology, is that it makes bias much more manifest. However, that's also the good news. And the reason it's the good news is that it actually shows us our bias much more efficiently than other types of technologies do, because now we can look at it and we can say, well, wait a minute, um, this group of people is missing, or this group of people isn't, um, isn't reflected right, or there are no women in the photograph, you know, in the photographs that are supposed to rese uh, resemble women. And so that's the good news and the bad news uh, about computer vision technology. Uh, I would say, as I said, there, we're still in the very early days of it, but it's pretty interesting, pretty exciting. You'll be hearing more about it. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, we've got time for a few questions. So uh, has anybody got any questions about computer vision? I don't see any. Okay, I've got a question. All right. What is uh, the sort of privacy, um, the privacy kind of laws around that at the minute? Because it seems like it could be quite intrusive. Yeah, it, it absolutely can be. So the, here's the thing. It, I would say here in the, um, in the EU, the privacy laws for visual data would probably follow the privacy laws for any other data, right? So that, that's the first piece. The second piece, however, is that there are implications of visual content that go beyond what the laws are able to do. So in the US, you know, we have this, these issues where you start to combine text and, vi and, and, and images, or you start to use images in new ways, and none of the laws, none of the policies have been able to account for that. We have legislation in the United States, uh, in the California state legislature, uh, re regarding, for example, use of location data and things like that. So for example, um, in um, different apps and whether they should include location data, we'll see the same kinds of issues come up as computer vision becomes more mature. But the, the, the short answer is that this is always going to be far behind uh, the law's ability to deal. We're going to be dealing with a lot more, uh, probably a lot more litigation in the US. I think, you know, clearly with the, with the laws here in the EU, the, there's a lot more restriction, which can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing. I think we're just gonna have to see how it plays out. Yep. Okay, and I right. actually do have a follow-up question to yeah. that, is um, which big companies right now, if you're allowed to, if you know of any, are yeah, kind sure. of looking at this, or sure. what's their use case right now? Sure, so the use cases, uh, a lot of the use cases that are happening, we see beverage companies, hotel companies, fashion are using it, airlines, um, consumer electronics, I mean, it's, it's pretty broad across industries. I think typically, you know, if you have a highly visual brand, um, it becomes very interesting very fast. But I think that even if you don't have a highly visual brand, if you're a business-to-business -business company and you're doing something like holding a conference and you want to have a live stream, how you need to have some kind of protection in place in case people decide that they want to tweet or post you know, photos that are inappropriate. This is also true, for example, with terroristic content, right? That you, don't, you wanna also have some protections in place for people not to see that. And also for your employees not to have to go through video by video and watch them. Um, there are cases of, um, of foreign correspondents in the Middle East who have been covering Syria and, um, you know, and, and ISIS for quite some time who are developing PTSD from having to watch and vet these videos over and over again. So it actually having algorithms to do some of that work and get some of that work out of the way is, is kind of a good thing in that context. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Oh, there's a, sorry, there's a question oh. in here, oh, yeah, so we'll, sure. we'll take that. Can you tell us a little about the technology part? Yeah. Ken Berger here. Um, the technology side. 
I'd love to hear, you know, you must, I'm not assuming you're a deep technologist, maybe you are, but what technologies do you see that are just on the, the horizon? Things that we're almost there, we're not quite there yet, but once they come out, this stuff will blow up to be something amazing or something horrible and sinister and that kind of thing. You mean related to computer vision or, com or just in general? Com oh, computer vision, data science, that behind Yeah, so yeah. with the computer vision stuff, what's interesting now is that, um, is that the technologies that are out there are mostly being used for digital marketing, you know, for things like the sponsorships and uh, the moments of consumption. There's also sort of um, the fact that, you know, if you, if you are a company like Apple and you want to understand who's buying iPhones or who's buying Apple Watches, as an example, uh, you can't see where those transactions happen. You can see them in the store, but you can't necessarily see them in social channels. Um, until somebody posts a photograph of themselves wearing an Apple Watch, then you can start to see it, and you can start to see the context in which they're proudly showing off their watch or their car or their sneakers or whatever it might be. So the challenge here is to turn is to connect the computer vision with the data science so that you can start to understand that over time, more people are doing one thing or doing less. If you're a, a food and beverage company, to start to understand how things like flavor, you know, flavor profiles travel or a new fruit flavor that all of a sudden is really popular. I mean, there was a huge yuzu thing happening in the US for some period of time. Um, we're all done with kale, I'm sure. Uh, but, but the technologies that actually make this scalable, I think, are the kind of killer app for this, and that also make it self-service, because right now you really do need people who are fairly uh, knowledgeable about how neural networks work and how to train data sets and things like that to do the technology. So it's going to follow that similar path that happened with natural language processing, where at first it was a, you know, a few sort of very well-trained analysts, and then it became something that was a self-service dashboard. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Go have lunch and enjoy. Thank you.